good to see you this morning. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse number 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. We're going to be looking at the passage wherein Paul gives an athletic metaphor, uh, talking about racing and boxing and those sorts of things. And I don't know if you've ever wondered why Paul used so many athletic metaphors. I mean, think about it. He was a Pharisee. Uh, the Jews, much less the Pharisees, were not known for their athletic um, sports prowess, maybe would be the best word. Uh, Paul most likely knew nothing at all about athletics growing up. Being a Pharisee, his concentration would have been on the, the Torah and the Old Testament writings. So how is it? He came to use so many um, athletic metaphors. That's something that I've always wondered about. Obviously, he had some exposure to athletics somewhere, right? Well, let's uh, turn our attention over here, and I want to describe what you're looking at. Okay, Anybody know exactly what you're looking at? <laughs> this is uh, on the coast of Israel. This is the, on the Mediterranean Sea, and this is called Caesarea Maritima. Caesarea Maritima was built by Herod the Great before Christ was born. Just a decade or two before Christ was born, Caesarea Maritima was finished. It's an amazing archaeological site. And I'm just going to show you a little bit of what you're looking at, and, and maybe and I'm going to tie it into the message. First thing I want you to see, you see this over here? Uh, for those that are on this side, I'm, I'm looking at this. That's a That's a theater. That theater holds 4,500 people. It's the only, uh, and, and um, let me just say one more thing that I wasn't going to say, but this is built under the polis system that was inherited from the Greeks, and everything had to be laid out in a certain way. This is the only theater in the whole Roman Empire that faced the west. Now, why would it face the west when all other theaters face east? The, the answer is, if you've ever been to the coast, the onshore breezes. And the onshore breezes would keep everybody cool. Everywhere else in the Roman Empire, they turned it the other way to keep people cool. Um, secondly, this is Herod the Great's palace, this thing that juts out right here, okay, down here. Notice how it's out into the sea. Herod had a boat dock right here with a ship always docked there because he was paranoid, that there was going to be an insurrection. Right in the middle of his palace, by the way, there's a curved part. All of his palaces had this curved uh, rotunda, half rotunda that, that stuck out at the end. If you go to Masada, you'll see the same thing, all his palaces. But notice this. This is a freshwater pool in the middle of his palace at sea level. How'd that freshwater pool get there? Well, he ha he, there's no springs anywhere around here. He had water piped in on aqueducts from um, Mount Carmel, which, if you remember, is where Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal about 12 miles away from there. Um, but this right here on the end, this elongated thing, is what we call a hippodrome. And that's where chariot races and foot races, parades, and all sorts of different events where that is, it's 1,400 feet long and 290 feet wide. It doesn't look that long or that big looking at the ruins there, does it? Well, um, that's where the athletic events happen. And the reason I'm showing you this is this little nondescript building right here, that, notice it's between the palace and everything else on land, that is called the praetorium. And the praetorium is where the troops were housed. Remember I said that Herod was, was paranoid. And so he housed the troops between him and everybody else. In Jerusalem, it was called Antonius Fortress, and it was connected to the temple, um, Mount Proper. And the praetorium not only housed Roman troops, but it also served as a prison. And we know that Paul was there for two years. And so for two years, most likely, Paul had a view to the Hippodrome and saw the athletic events and all the practicing going on. 
and he learned a lot about athletics there. Now, let me say this. If you know anything about your history, um, Paul was in Corinth in 51 A.D., and he was imprisoned here about 57 A.D., 57 to 59 A.D., but he obviously had a lot of exposure to athletics in his travels and things like that. And I'm saying all that as a setup for our sermon today. If you'll stand with me, we'll read our passage, and then we'll get into our text. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives a prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the scripture. We thank you for the, the multicolored uh, a presentation of biblical truth and how vibrant it is and, and how alive um, your scriptures are. And I pray that you will uh, speak to our hearts today and help us to not live our lives aimlessly, but live for the prize and for the goal. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you very much. Now remember that Paul is leading by example. He's showing the Corinthians how that uh, they too can imitate him by limiting their freedoms, by doing things that he did to love others. For example, he forego pay. He would forego his right as a uh, Christian to eat certain things. And he, he did all this, number one, so that he could witness, and number two, so he didn't offend a weaker brother. But today we're going to see that there's a third reason why he exercised self-control. And we find that he had self-discipline for the purpose of winning the prize. In verse number 24, he explains why he limits freedoms and why he uh, exercises self-discipline. Look at verse 24. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives a prize? He explains a little more about what that prize is. Verse number 25 Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Now, obviously, what Paul is referring to is called the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games uh, were held every other year in Corinth, and they were very similar to their more famous big brother, the Olympic Games, which were held every four years. The Isthmian Games... In them, athletes competed in all kinds of different events, such as the 200 and the 400-yard races, um, discus and javelin, chariot racing, and gymnastics. And there, as I said, they were held every other year, and we know that they were held in 51 A.D., and guess who happened to be in Corinth in 51 A.D.? Wouldn't that be a great opportunity to witness to people, to evangelize, and a reason for him to give an athletic metaphor as well. He was there during the Isthmian Games. And he goes on to say that these athletes trained very hard for a prize. You know what the prize was? We call it a crown or a wreath. You know what it's made of? Wilted celery leaves. They competed for a perishable wreath made of wilted celery leaves. It gives a whole new meaning to the word perishable, doesn't it? Yet athletes devoted themselves to winning the prize. And Paul says, well, okay, in contrast, look at a prize that's held out for us who are believers in Jesus Christ. We have an imperishable crown of righteousness and glory ahead of us. And when we finally cross the line, when, when God's grace, by God's grace, we finish the race and that God marked out for her, and we cross that line and we go into eternity, there is a prize to be won. It's a crown of unfading glory. And Paul personally presses hard for that prize. You know, he'd already talked about rewards in chapter 3, hadn't he? In verse number 13, he said, each one's work will become manifest for the day. What day is he talking about there? 
the day of the Lord, right? The day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a ward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. So Paul's talking about those rewards. You know that Christ talked about rewards constantly, right? His very first public sermon, the very first section of a sermon, is all about rewards. He summed it up. He said this in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 12, Rejoice and be glad for your, your what? Your reward is great in heaven. Okay? He, uh, Matthew 6, uh, 19 to 24, he talks about reward. He talks about laying up treasures in heaven. Remember that? Do not lay up treasures on earth. Lay up treasures in heaven where nothing corrupts. And, of course, there's, there's many ways to earn a reward. I love this one, and I think about this for every person that serves the body of Jesus Christ in a quiet, unassuming way. Christ said this, For truly I say to you, whoever gives a cup of cold water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Isn't that wonderful? It is. That's the impact of, of serving others that's the reward that we get. In, in his last teaching to the 12 on the, on the Mount of Olives, they ask him about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the signs of his coming, the second coming. And you know what he spends most of his time getting ready? We always focus upon the prophetic part. Most of his discussion is talking about how to earn rewards. The parable of the talents. Remember that? Uh, he said, if you're faithful, uh, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And so rewards, we don't serve God just because we're thankful. That's a great reason to serve. We serve because we get rewards. The athletes of the Isthmian Games, they received a, a wreath of wilted celery leaves that's perishable. And Paul calls it perishable. In other words, what he meant was the joy of that fades over time. Those, perish, those wilted celery leaves, eventually, you just throw the wreath away, right? Paul's talking about how the, how the joy of that reward fades. It's kind of like me. Um, I don't really get too excited about celebrating Super Bowl 30 as a Cowboys fan too much anymore. Yeah, you can laugh real hard. I know some of you are not Cowboys fans, okay? You should be. But um, Paul's goal, Paul's goal is an imperishable crown that never fades. The joy never fades of the, of the, the joy of it never fades. And what is that crown? What is the crown of righteousness that he's talking about? It's eternal life itself. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast in the trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. We see two things. We see eternal life, and we see an, um, a, a, a fruit of salvation. What is one fruit of salvation? That you love him. Do you love him? If you love him, that's a sign that you are a believer. Um, those who love Jesus Christ will receive eternal life. John speaks of it. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life, Revelation 2.10. And so the prize is eternal life. If the prize is eternal life, then how do we make sure that we attain it? If that's the prize, how do we attain it? Is it by asking Jesus into your heart? Is that how you make sure you attain it? Remember, who is he speaking to right now? He's speaking to believers. Notice what he says, verse number 24. He says it right there, so run that you may obtain it. You see it right at the end? So run that you may obtain it. Now that is the literal word order in the original language. So run that you may obtain it. Four words, that's the way it's laid out in, in the original language. Many translations, however, do some interpreting. And that, that's okay, because if you look at what Paul's saying, he's going to explain how you run. Okay, if you're going to run, he's going to explain how you run. And so many translations say something differently 
run in a way that you may attain it. I don't know if your translation says that or not. Most of them say something similar to that. But the literal word order, I think, brings out a slightly different emphasis. Listen to it this way. Ready? Now he just gets in saying, we obtain an imperishable crown, right? And he says, so run that you may obtain it. Do you see a difference there? He says, so run that you may obtain it. Now again, um, what is he saying? He is saying this. What if, what if Paul is simply saying, go ahead and run, and when you run, you will obtain the prize? I think that's what he's saying here. Run that you may obtain the prize. Get in the race. Get involved. Get busy. Is Paul teaching work salvation here? No, he's not, actually. Because what he's teaching us is to live intentionally. He's calling the Corinthians and us to live like someone who is going to inherit a crown of life, righteousness. Live like someone who's going to inherit eternal life. Verse 25. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. And just like the athlete, he says, So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. An elite athlete has to be focused, don't they? Do we have any elite athletes here? All right. We got any elite armchair quarterbacks? All right, we got a lot of those, right? An elite, elite athlete has to be focused. They keep their eyes on the goal. Have you ever, um, have you ever seen the documentary Free Solo? Anybody? All right, a couple of you. You ought to watch it. Uh, it's, a, a, it's about the climber named Alex Hanold. And he is the first person to climb El Capitan in Yosemite without any kind of safety equipment. No ropes, no nothing, freehand all the way up, 3,000 feet straight up a rock face. And the, the documentary, Free Solo, follows his quest to climb it. His training, his practice, repeated over and over and over. Quite literally, Alex handled was single-mindedly focused on the same goal for a couple years. Uh, he had it in mind for nine years, and he finally did it uh, after a couple years of that's the only thing he focused on, the training and the strength it requires to hold your body weight by jamming your fingers into a crack is, is, is almost beyond comprehension. After years of training and a couple years of practice, he finally achieved his goal on June 30th, 2007, or June 3rd, 2017. And if you're afraid of heights, watch it on the biggest TV you possibly can. You're going to love it, okay? But, but he did this. And you know what he said in there? He said, I don't care if there's cameras watching me. National Geographic followed him around. He said, I would just as well do it without anybody watching. Just climb it because of the joy of getting that done. But he would be an elite athlete in his area, single-mindedly focused. The Olympics, same way. Those athletes are single-mindedly focused. Now listen, when you get saved, your life has purpose. When you get saved, you have one goal. And that goal is to win the prize. And the prize is eternal life. Let me, let me ask a question. Paul said, I don't live aimlessly. What does it mean? What does he mean by living aimlessly? Well, he explains it very thoroughly in the text. But it's basically if you live aimlessly by living for your own desires and pleasures. Okay? By, by feeding your bodily appetites a sinful, a, a, to a sinful extent or sinful bodily appetites. And he says, I don't want to live aimlessly. And you do that, you do that by killing sin. You do it by killing sin. The proof that we are not living aimlessly is that we live a life of killing sin. Run, Paul says, so as to win and not be disqualified. 
Do not, do not presume upon grace. Stop striving and pressing to take a hold of that for which God has taken a hold of you in Jesus Christ. In summary, can I tell you what the summary is? There are no passive Christians. None. So he says in verse number 25, look at verse 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. That's the hallmark of their life, self-control as, as a mark of an athlete, serious about breaking the tape at the end of the race. They're up early, they have a strict diet, they do all exercise routines to strengthen muscles and build stamina, and they assess every aspect of their life by one great question. You ready? Will this make me stronger, faster, and better? Will it help me win the race? And if, if not, it has no, lot, um, no place in that athlete's life. They exercise extraordinary self-control. And Paul says, guess what? That's what I strive to be. And this whole chapter, this whole section is about example. And he's basically saying, so you too must be, have that example. And they do it, he reminds us, for a perishable wreath, for wilted celery. And our prize is so much more glorious, so much more worthy of all of our energy, all of our effort. The truth is, if you're like me, you like to excuse your apathy, don't you? I'm the only one that excuses my apathy, I know. We like to avoid systems and habits and embracing accountability. We avoid that, don't we? That's legalistic, we'll say, but it's not. It's simply self-control. It's just discipline. It's what grace produces as we seek to please the Lord. It's an athlete's attitude, getting himself or herself ready to run the race so as to win the prize. Isn't that what Paul means in verse number 27? Look at it again. Verse 27, I discipline my body, he says, and keep it under control. Now, that word discipline is a very interesting word. You know what it means? It means to punch under the eye. He's literally saying, I give myself a black eye. It's a knockout punch. He's not saying that there's something especially holy and self-harm. What he's saying is, I am resolved to beat my sin into submission. I am resolved to beat my bodily appetites that want to go off the charts in the wrong direction. I want to bring them into the conformity and will of Jesus Christ that requires some gutsy fighting with myself. Sin's like a bruiser in a bare-knuckle fight. It knocks you down. It wants to knock your lights out. It wants to destroy you. And though we may be inclined to shrink from the battle, to do so is to face disqualification. Paul is saying here that we're called to enter the ring. We're called to stay in the fight. And so my question is, are you? Are you in the fight? Or is self-discipline against bodily appetite just too much to ask? I wonder if you signed a truce with your sin. Have you signed a truce in some area of your life? Paul wants you to get back in the ring and fight on. Sin seeks your destruction. I love John Owen, his famous line, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And that's Paul's exhortation to us here. Don't think to coast. Don't simply hear the message of rest and think that means to be passive. Don't be passive at all. And so Paul asks us to fight with our eyes fixed on the prize. We're to run our race with perseverance and looking where? Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is our reward. He's the one in whom we trust. And he himself, the author and finisher of our faith, we don't fight on our own, by the way, do we? In our own strength, with our own energy, we don't do that. And so you can face the dreadful opponent of sin. And you know what? 
To be quite honest, sometimes it's a very painful battle to fight against our bodily appetites, isn't it? It's, it's sometimes very hard. It feels like you've been given a punch when you say no to that craving when we want to self-medicate. When we want to give in to sexual sin, or we overeat, or we're given to too much alcohol, to, to say no when everything in us wants, says more, more, we need to fight against those temptations. And it's like a punch in our face or to our body. And it's hard to do, to keep swinging, to keep slugging. But remember, we do not fight alone. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. And because he will sustain and keep us, we'll be sure to win. Don't sign a truce with your sin. It's not a futile fight. Don't give up. You will not be losing on the losing side as you trust in Christ. So fight on and run as one who wins the, the prize. I want to finish with a sobering reminder. And you do this all so that you avoid disaster. Now, what do I mean by that? Paul, what's at stake? Let, let's just run a scenario real quick. Let's say Paul the Apostle just decides to start running aimlessly. And he just starts indulging himself. Suppose that his uh, boxing amounted uh, to no more than shadow boxing. By the way, I don't think he means when he says beating the air, he's talking about shadow boxing. I think he's talking about he's lost control and he's missing the mark when he tries to punch. But that's another thing. Um, What if Paul were to forego the training and discipline that marked the Christian life? Well, then so what? Well, verse 27, if you will, you'll see his concern. What does he say? He's anxious, and he says this. He says, lest, after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Now, that's a sobering line to read. That's coming from the pen of the Apostle Paul, and there is a disaster that he is seeking to avoid. You might be thinking, yeah, but he's the preacher. He's the apostle. Surely, of all people, Paul doesn't need to be concerned about this. I mean, if there's anybody who's got a lock, anybody who's a sure thing, it's the apostle Paul. If, if anybody's going to cross the finish line, Paul's going to do it, right? That's what we like to think. But Paul, I mean, if Paul were right here and he were to say something like that, You'd want to just wrap him over the knuckle and say, Paul, what are, you, what are you saying? I mean, you're the apostle. You're the man. But that's not his perspective at all. Now, understand something, what Paul is doing here. He is not doubting his salvation. Neither, and this is an important point, neither is he presuming on grace to think that he can just simply coast. You see? He's not doubting salvation and he's not coasting. He knows this. He knows that those whom God redeems are those who work and pursue and strive uh, with all their energy to live for Christ and to win the prize. And so Paul understands, and this is scary, please listen, it's possible to be a powerful preacher of the truth, to move people by your words, to touch them with your rhetoric, to sway them with your eloquence, to inspire people and impact them with your message. It's possible to preach the true gospel with urgency and feeling and possibly even that God in his grace would use such preaching to save sinners and encourage and comfort the the saints and still, after doing that, to be disqualified. I have two friends who are pastors before they got saved. One I went to college with, he got saved in his 30s. One that I met in Memphis when I was there, he got saved in his 50s. It is possible to be used of God to preach the gospel just like Paul and be disqualified. The word he uses here for disqualified is very important. You know what it means when he says disqualified? It means counterfeit. That's the meaning of the word. False currency. It's used in Hebrews 6.8 to describe 
land that ought to produce a harvest of fruit, but instead it only produces thorns and thistles. Hebrews calls it worthless. That's the same word as disqualified. It is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is burned. That's a terrible tragedy that Paul is striving to avoid. He doesn't want his Christian life um, to be false currency. He doesn't want it to be a wasteland that produces no harvest. So what Paul is saying is this, and, and it bears all of us to listen. Do not think of yourself beyond the danger of making a shipwreck of your life. Do not allow yourself to presume upon grace so that you neglect the diligence in Christian obedience, lest after preaching to others, you yourself will be disqualified. Now you might ask, your mask, well, how do you know that this is what Paul is teaching? Well, if you look in your Bibles in chapter number 10 of 1 Corinthians, he gives an illustration of this that we'll go through next week. And the illustration is basically the children of Israel in the wilderness. That's his illustration. And he says, in, if you look at the very first word of chapter 10, what is it? Four. So he's connecting chapter 10 to what he just said. And he says four. And he, he connects this illustration of the Israelites in the wilderness. And what did they do? You, you know their story. They started out strong, didn't they? Ten plagues. Yeah. Crossing the Red Sea. Yeah. And then all of a sudden what? They start complaining. Then they get to Sinai. And God's got this big smoking uh, cloud and thunder and the sound of horns and earthquakes. And they're scared to death of God on Mount Sinai. God um, writes the covenant. Moses gives the covenant of God to them. And they said, that's right, we're going to follow God. And you know what the Bible said, what Paul said about them in chapter number 10? With most of them, God was not pleased. And the example that he gives is that they went from saying, yes, I'll follow God, to following fleshly appetites. And even though their confession was, we love God, their lives showed they didn't love God. They loved themselves, and they died, and they spent eternity away from God the vast majority of those that came out of Egypt. That's a very sobering warning, isn't it? The appetites of the flesh were more attracted to them than the promises of God. And so you, it's not just listening to a person's confession, it's looking at their life, your life. How do you look at your life? Paul had that, that concern in, in, in 1 Corinthians 9, right? Did he finish strong? He did, didn't he? This is what he told Timothy at the end of his life. I didn't beat the air. I didn't run aimlessly. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which is what? Eternal life, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Praise the Lord for that. He was kept by Jesus Christ. And the proof of his keeping was that it was an attitude towards sin and fleshly indulgences and all that sort of thing. Let me ask you, are you running strong? Interesting phenomena. When COVID-19 hit, that was, for me, that was a great break. I bet you some of you enjoyed that break as well. I, that was the first time in decades that I got to spend, I got to go to work and come home and not have anything else to do. I did that for about three weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer, I don't know, three weeks for sure. It was wonderful. Sometimes I would tell Heather, I, I wish I could just continue the schedule. But it doesn't work that way, does it? I, many people express how they enjoyed it. Let me ask, have you re-engaged in the fight? Because one of the things that happened when people stayed home is they indulged their appetites. I read that, that porn use skyrocketed. Alcohol sales skyrocketed. 
food sales skyrocketed. No telling how many shipwrecks were made during that crisis when people got a little bit of a break and they just relaxed every area of their life. Have you reengaged in the ministry of the body of Christ? The trend nationwide is that many are not. Are you coasting? Are you trying to complete the home stretch of your race by taking it easy? Have you signed a truce with sin? Are you shadow boxing in the corner when you ought to be in the ring? The Lord is calling us in his word, isn't he? Run so you can win the prize. Fight that we may win the battle. Amen and amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for Paul's attitude. I'm sure most people are just like me. If anybody's got a lock, it's the Apostle Paul, right? But Lord, we can't relax against sin. Sin is seeking to destroy us constantly. And so right now, right here, I know that your Holy Spirit is speaking to hearts. I pray that people won't mark whatever is in their mind off to just some kind of coincidence, but rather that they'll respond to the genuine help of the Holy Spirit who's trying to show them areas of their life where they need to strive to be more like Jesus so they can win the race. I pray that on that day, all of us will stand before you and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. In your wonderful Savior's name, amen.